Hello, and welcome back to the Ask the Color Expert podcast. Today's special guest is my friend, my longtime friend and the hardest guy to get in touch with on planet Earth. <laughs> I was just busting his chops before we hit record. Uh, Ian McCabe, he resides in, are you in DC or right outside of DC? Um, so I work in DC, but I live outside of DC in Virginia. Got it. So he lives outside yep. of Perks in DC and we have been friends a really long time. Um, we met long, long time ago at a Nancy Braun hair painting class and yep. we had, we hit it off and I tell him that we need to be the sunny and share of hair color and take our act on the road. Cause when we get together, we have a lot of fun, <clears throat> but we also are very informative and we're super passionate about sharing what we know about hair color. So we're going to welcome Ian. We're going to have a super um, laid back, easy conversation with absolutely no structure because that's how we roll and that's that's our best conversation. That's our gig. <laughs> <laughs> Your interview in my membership is still to this date one of the most popular that people refer to. Um, my members are beyond excited that you're coming to the retreat to um, educate with us and share all of your wonderful knowledge. We're going to have so much fun in sunny Florida in March. So we're excited. I about cannot, that. I cannot wait. I know I'm going to, I'm going to kidnap your ass. If you stand me up, I'm going to send, send the cavalry. <laughs> I'll end up in a body bag somewhere. <laughs> exactly. So one of my favorite conversations that you and I had was we traveled as much as we could to different, you know, hair events. And we always yep. would meet up and have cocktails and share our thoughts of the day. And one of the most informative, uh, life-changing, career-changing conversations that I had was with you and my sidekick, Ray. We were trying to have lunch at a BTC event that they didn't plan well for lunch and the line was yeah. out the door. So we spent more time in line than we did at the class. Um, and we just started chatting with other people in line, other hairdressers about blonding and everyone's frustration with warmth. And we all know, you know, how difficult warmth can be and how much we have to fight it. And you just blurted out, you know, this comment about, well, girl, why are you using permanent color? Why don't you just use Demi? And I was like, I do, I'm, I'm using, you know, cream color touch Demi. And you're like, no, 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 shades of Q girl, just shades of Q. And I was like, really for gray? Like I'm put with the head to the side. Like I always used it to refresh ends and yeah. for overall glossing, but I never thought that the amount of gray that I had could be taken care of with shades EQ until you said that. And that mm -hmm. changed not only my own hair and hair color. I have to send you a picture of my along the way blondes that you probably, you know, looked at and cringed with me trying to lighten my base a little bit and cover my gray, which most people do. Um, and now well, I, I look I at it and it's your, like, oh. I remember your, when, the, when I think it was at a class actually, and you, they started using Dia on your base, Dia color. Before right. it was, before it was Dia Light and it was, you know, pretty alkaline. And even that you were like, you know, it's better, but it's still so warm, you know, and, and Dia was, you know, could lift quite a bit. And so you were still, you know, it was a demi per se, but it was, you know, so alkaline that you were still getting uh, a very permanent you know, kind of color result, which was, you know, just warm, warmer than you wanted and warmer than uh, you were used to, you know, based on off of your natural and stuff. So exactly. I remember that for sure. And even um, your original formula you had shared with me about using the gray drops. And even with, if I go too far with the gray drops, I start yes. to get a little bit of shift to warm. that as exactly. well. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You have to be careful with the gray magic, like how much you use of that. Um, and, you know, if I need to use a touch more of that, you know, like maybe I will add a touch of something else in the formula, maybe so slightly cool it down, or I just use less drops, let it sit longer, maybe add a few minutes of heat. You know, there's all these different like manipulations, you know, based on the type of hair, you know, kind of thing um, that I, I just kind of feel like, you know, with color, it, you know, each head is a little different as, as we know. So it's like just kind of figuring out what works best for that particular person that particular particular head of hair um you know and how much coverage they're looking for too always you know comes into play well that's the perfect segue to my next comment that you 
crack me up with your being so brave with like, let's just try it, you know, on a person who's like a, a woman who's, you know, a politician in DC that's, that's spending hundreds and hundreds of dollars where I will spend days on, you know, human hair swatches mm -hmm. and like, you know, doing it on clippings from a client, like I'll do it in that way. But I'm so such a little nerd when it comes to actually just going for it on a head and yep. you just make it look like I was, I had the, the special opportunity to spend a day at your salon and I was just blown away by like all the little new, my favorite thing is doing that. We go to classes, right? And the person gets mm -hmm. up on the stage and 99% of the work is pre-done. We don't get to yep. see it where yep. I've seen you on stage and you show everybody everything, every step, everything. the good, the bad, yes. the ugly. And I love that. Um, a lot of times, you know, there's screw ups backstage and then they're not shared. So we all sit in the audience and feel bad about ourselves thinking, wow, they just totally pulled that off when they really did not yep. So your transparency and your, your honesty and your authenticity to me, I wish that I could be with you every time you teach and get on stage with you for the first 10 minutes, because when you first start, you're like so bashful and quiet oh, yeah. and it takes you a while to warm up. And then 20 minutes in, it's like, yes, he's hitting his, his yeah. groove and he is there. So like you have so much to share and so much to offer. Um, and it's like in the beginning, you're kind of like feeling the audience and maybe their energy is not where you want it to be. And, and that's usually they say the first five minutes is the toughest anyway. Yeah. Um, but I wish you could see in yourself, what I see in you as an educator, like when I watch you, I mean, I, I've been doing this 35 years and I sit there and I have a notebook, my hand is cramped with the amount of notes on the simple things like what you did for my formula and telling me about, like, I used to look at those gray magic drops and be like, what a bunch of bullshit. Who uses that? Oh, shit? I know, right? <laughs> and then you're like, like me? Who uses that? <laughs> So I was like, wow, really? And then I, and then I pushed, you know, I, I just said to Ian right before we hit record, I'm pushing shades to its absolute limit of covering my gray because I'm getting more and more gray, but I refuse to go back to permanent because I don't want that blorange color that comes sure. with permanent color. So I'd rather mm -hmm. see a little bit of gray left behind than see that dreaded orange. Yes. Um, but I think now, even with all the things that have changed in the industry and all the different brands, and you and I have been through so many brands and the amount of time yeah. we've done hair, because we just keep looking for it finally being the one that's going to solve all of those problems, where finally, I think 25 years into my career, I finally realized it's simply not possible to lift hair just a few levels and have it be cool because yeah. of remaining pigment contribution yep. that lives in the hair. So that was like, oh my gosh, finally, I understand it's not me. And it's not that I didn't pick the right brand. Yes. And there's so many colors listening right now that are like, wait, what? <laughs> there isn't a brand that's going to get rid of that? Well, I mean, it's like, <clears throat> I mean, I think you and I out of, out of, I, I mean, I, we both know a lot of colorists in the industry, right? And so I think you and I are probably two of the most, um, even though, you, you know, I'm probably more of like the, like a risk taker in a lot of ways. In, a, in one way, you and I both have been very comfortable trying a lot of lines. You know what I mean? And I don't know anyone else other than my, you know, other than you and I that have really used quite as many lines and it full on switch, you know, when we were salon owners, like switched the whole brand or added, had multiple full lines, you know, and then would get rid of one, bring another in. And, you know, I know that's like super scary for some people. And then too, I think there's a lot of people that, that are so tied to what they know, you know, for 15, 20 years, they only use this one line. And for me, I think that's very limiting because you know, I think it is good to see what other things have to offer. Not that I think there's this like eight level eight ash that, that, that is this magic formula that like, you know, can somehow magically come back as cool as it, as it, as it left and, you know, doesn't fade warm. I mean, as we, you know, both know that it's not really uh, so possible when you're dealing with natural hair, but I do think it allowed you and I both to really understand 
you know, the difference of more of an opaque based, you know, kind of coverage, something more translucent, something in between, something where, you know, the naturals were, you know, already, you know, fairly cool where the naturals were warmer and, and all of these things, you know, and how it left to how it came back and understanding maybe the ammonia content or the alkalinity of one line versus another. I do think by you and I both going through all of those things, it taught us a lot, you know, and really understanding the difference of finishes even. So not just having a permanent color or a demi-permanent color, right? Because within that realm, there is a whole lot of, of different, you know, finishes and different, you know, uh, tonal values and stuff. So I think that is one really cool thing, you know, by you and I being fearless in that way, it's really taught us a lot. And, and there are huge differences between some of these lines. And sometimes those differences are the difference between good and great. You know, they can really help us achieve something um, with one line that maybe it would be a lot harder with another or, uh, you know, or things like that. Absolutely. I actually was just, um, I purchased a virtual class. Um, it's someone who's very well known in the industry, has, has a bajillion Instagram followers, and she's doing a demo and she pulls out Shades EQ NA and she's like, I'm going to use this um, 8NA because it's green. And I was like, whoa, back up. When did NA become green? Like she's sharing that with I don't know how many people she sold this course to. And that's someone who's, you know, charging people for education and spreading the word. And there's so yesterday on Facebook, someone said, I did a root shadow with six ABN. Why is it so blue green? It was on a fresh highlight. And I'm like, mm -hmm. why did you use six ABN on a fresh white highlight at the root yep. of someone's hair and expect it not to be blue green? There's so a it baffles my mind that there's people working with these chemicals that can alter someone's hair color, you know, and don't really understand. It's almost like, have you ever had a colorist describe Shades of Q by the name? You know, they're like, oh, I can't even think of a name off the top of my head except for papaya, but they're like, oh, I put papaya and whatever. I'm like, yeah. I used Irish cream. I'm like, yeah, oh. is that how you're choosing it by like the, yeah. the fun name, like OPI nail polish? Or do you mm -hmm. really understand the background tones, the hue, the saturation, the level, like there's so much more to it. Yet trying to teach all of that, I always try to get that, you know, boiled down to like a one session class and it's impossible. It's absolutely it's impossible. impossible. It really is. I mean, <clears throat> for me, it, the, the thing that I really, um, I, I guess the thing that I've really learned, you know, one is like how, how people's foundation is just not there a lot of times, you know? <clears throat> and, and I think too, it's like people get so, you know, I would tell my team all the time, you know, when I, when I had the salons and everything, and you know, when I train people, I always, go, I always say the same thing, right? Everyone's like, <clears throat> I think before the highlights rinsed, before anything, they're like, I think I want to use like eight, <laughs> 8N and I think I want to use um maybe some 8T and I'm like okay so why do you think that and I was like and two until you see that head rinsed and combed out and done I'm like by you having it planned in your head what you're going to you know what you want to use <clears throat> the problem with that is then when you go to actually look at it you're looking at it with like these glasses with 8N and 8T already in your brain so you're not seeing it for what it is. You're seeing it for what maybe you want it to be, or like you heard this cool formula and you have to use that. And whether it's irrelevant to what you have in front of you, you're going to do that. And I think it's so important to really lift to the level you need. Like what is your target level? You know, if you want it cool, if you want it warm, those things, sure. You definitely need to know that where you're going, where you're starting, where you're going. <clears throat> if I want something cooler, I know I'm going to need to lift out more of the remaining pigment so I can put something over it and get a cooler result. You know, maybe not lifting it so far that I then have to re refill it or something, you know, add something into my gloss to then, you know, counteract the fact that I've over lifted. But <clears throat> the goal is to lift, you know, where you need it, you know, and if that means slightly above or whatever, you know, those are all things, you know, we need to know going into it. But once we have the hair rinsed and brushed out, then I think is when we start 
figuring out what we're going to gloss with. Having it in our minds, what we want to use is, it, it's not a feeling. It is really, there's the art and the science that come together with that, but it's not a feeling. It is really looking at what's in front of you and using our you know, knowledge and logic to really get to the end result we want. And <clears throat> I think we have to really be, get into the habit of doing that because it's really, it's really hurting a lot of colorists because they see a popular formula and they think this is good for everyone. And it's like, this is not correct. You know, 100%. I think so, it's more of a recipe than a formula. It's like, oh, you, you hear colors say, I, I always use my go-to X, Y, Z. And I'm like, you can't have a go-to. And, and most issues in blonding is the improper lift, not the glazing formula. Because to your point, they have the formula in their head. They only lift it to an, a very uneven eight. And then they plan to glaze away their mistake. If they have a, a really pale root, they're going to deepen the root. If they have a really brassy mid and end, they're going to tone that differently. So now they're doing all these customized, you know, patchy toning and calling it melting and blending. And they think it's like mm -hmm. a cool technique, but really it's like, oh, I, I screwed up and mm -hmm. I have to make all this even again. So that yep. drives me. I mean, that's where I'm old school. And you've always been an old soul. Like you were trained yep. so well that you are an old soul where it hurts your eyes for someone to mm -hmm. not lift properly and try to cover it up. I remember yep. when you did my hair, when I got to be your model, greatest day of my life, um, <laughs> when you were teaching. And, you know, for me, I was like sweating for you because the people in the class were like, come on, come on, come on. We want to go. We want to see her finished. Yep. And you let people leave that class. Like, I'll never forget yeah. that. Like I have mad respect for you because you did not just pull my foils and overtone me. You were like, yeah. no, she's not done. She has a couple yeah. foils that need more time and she's not done. And if you guys need to go, I'll send you the picture of her after. And I was like, wow, that is like really amazing to me. I don't know many educators or colorists that would ever do that. It's, it's more yeah. convenience for them. Like, oh, it'll be fine. We'll just tone it out, but you know, you're getting that phone call in four days from yep. the client when the glaze is, you know, not freshly done. I mean, I think it's just, <clears throat> you know, there was a quote, so I have like, I'm going to butcher this, but there's a quote that, um, that I read the other day and it's, and I, and I used to say the same thing, probably not as elegantly, and I'm not going to say this elegantly now. So it's, you know, <laughs> forgive me for that, but it's along the lines of like, it's only a mistake when we don't go back and fix it. Right. So I don't really believe in like, you know, I see all the time, like people would, would be like so comfortable letting things walk out that like they knew was wrong. And I'm like, okay, you may not have time to fix it today, but like, I mean, I've, I've called my clients and I've been like, I need you to come back. They're like, I don't love it. Why do you, why do you, yeah. you know? And even like, they're like, no, yeah, and I like it. I'm like, I love it. I'm like, no, I really need you to come back. If you like it now, you're going to love it when I'm done. You just have to trust me on this. Yeah. And, you know, I think we always have to remember that, like, you know, even take the client out of it, right? Like, I want to do work that I believe in. I want to do work that I feel good about. I want to do work where I'm feeling like I'm pushing the boundary to be better and better, you know? And if we want to be great at what we do, we have to always perform like we're trying to be the best or like we're hungry to be the best, not like we've arrived there or, or we are the best, you know, think of Olympians. I mean, they, they train, like, even if they are number one in the world or record holder, holders or whatever, they're training, like they need to beat the number one person, you know, whether it's themselves or someone else. And so I always have this internal drive to like be better than I was yesterday, irrelevant to everyone else, you know? So I think that that is the one thing where Instagram and certain things are, you know, as great as it, as it is at times, it's also like people can really phone in a lot and they can really like hit the angle just perfectly with their phone and the lighting and the filtering and all these things. And then you see it in person, you're like, that was nowhere near what I saw in person, you know? And so I think we just have to really remember that the competition, yes, is with ourselves, and we need to always push to be better and, and, and to really stay hungry for, you know, knowledge and for, um, 
and just for the possibility that like something could be better, you know, not just thinking, we, oh, because we did it, it must be great. Like something can always be better, you know? I love that. And I agree a hundred percent. And I, and to your point about Instagram, that was something that I wanted to touch on. You're not huge on posting on Instagram at all. And you mm -hmm. are one of the busiest colorists I know. And I think to your point about that phone call to the client saying, Hey, I saw something on your hair that I didn't have time to fix that day. And I really need you to come back. That is a testament to why you're so booked without using social media. And I've been with you when you've done a color and posted the photo. And I, I know that you don't filter and I know that you put it right up and I know that it looks exactly like it. And I also know many other colors. So I've been right with them and they sit there for 30 minutes editing mm -hmm. the photo before they put it up. And I'm like, this is the reason that the, the average colorist who is not good with Instagram and photo taking and their phone, that can be the make or break, unfortunately, now with the way the world is. But the difference mm -hmm. is, again, I referred to you as an old soul earlier, you being an old soul, you understand that the power of word of mouth is always going to trump any Instagram account. Yes. A client yes. leaving your salon and going to lunch and having five women do a double take on how gorgeous their hair is, is going to actually send that person immediately to book an appointment, not just to shop your Instagram feed, in my opinion. Sure. I mean, I know I'm, I'm old school no. too, but. I mean, I think it, I mean, you know, as much technology and all that there is, right? Like there are just some tried and true principles in life, right? I mean, if someone does a great job and someone sees that, you know, they're going to say, hi, you know, who did your hair, you know, get your information. If that person loves what you did, they're going to tell their friends, whoever, because they're excited, they're happy about that. <clears throat> you know, not to say you can't get clients off of social media and stuff, but I find it so interesting that people have the opportunity when every person sits in their chair to earn multiple new clients off of just that one client, right? The experience that client has they'll talk about that, you know, the way, the way you made them feel, you know, the professionalism you had in behind the chair, how comfortable they were, how elevated the, the service itself was, how the end result is, you know, and, and for me, that is always the most important, you know, but their service and their experience with me is also super, super important. And, you know, I don't understand when so many people are always more worried about the Instagram post and rushing to the back room. And I'm like, you're a guest or your client is out there. Like, and you're rushing through that so you can get to the post like that to me never really added up because you have a chance to earn so many people off of someone that's already here, you know? And so I think we have to remember to take care of the people that we already have. And if they aren't referring clients to us, <clears throat> what does that say, you know? And, and, if we've been, and if you've been in the industry for many years and you don't have a full book, I think you have to look and ask yourself, what am I doing wrong? You know, and, and that's okay. You know, it's just that whatever, whatever you do with that information is what matters. You know, is it my formulation? Is it my application? Is it the experience? You know, where am I, what am I doing that isn't adding up to me being a fully booked, you know, colorist or stylist or whatever. And <clears throat> same with raising prices. I see people wanting to raise prices far before they're ready to raise prices. Again, it's not a feeling. It is demand on time. When your demand on time is gr so great and you are fully booked, that is when I believe you raise prices. It is not because you've been doing hair for three years or four years or you haven't raised them in a while. Like what's a while, you know what I mean? All of these things that people think emotion should dictate, for me, it really is clear cut. It's demand on time. When you are busy at this level, then you raise prices and it makes a little room for some new people to come in and then when you get fully booked again, you raise prices. It is not because you have 20,000 followers on Instagram, you know? Right. And I've seen the other extreme where people are not raising prices and they jump on social media and say, I'm so booked. I'm working, you know, seven days, 12 hours a day. I'm so busy. And then someone says, raise your prices. And they're like, I can't, I'm afraid I'm going to lose a client. And they're like, what are your prices? It's like $35. I'm like, oh my God, you know? And yep. then, then they'll make a big glorious announcement of my book is closed. 
I am yes. no longer taking new clients. Like, I think that is like career suicide. You should always have your book open. If you're that far in demand, then just keep raising those prices and do what you do. I love that you referred to, you know, being in the industry longer and not having um, a full book. Retention is something that most of the newer stylists, all they want is balayage, balayage, balayage education. They're not taking the business classes and the professionalism and the consultations and formulation and all those other things. And they're becoming really good painters and really good photo editors. And the client leaves the salon, not looking like they do in the Instagram photo that their colorist posted. Yep. I had that, I, I have fallen for that. I've had two celebrity haircutters that were bomb on Instagram. I saw their work. I was like, oh my gosh, they were doing like a pop-up in New York City. I took the, the day off, went to New York, made a big day of it, was so excited. I left their salon and I'm walking around Manhattan and my hair is just like drooping, drooping, drooping. I look like I just rolled out of bed. The haircut mm -hmm. didn't do what I needed it to do when I went to style it. And I'm like, the one was I think 450 for the cut and the other one was mm -hmm. like 325. Like these were not inexpensive haircuts. Yeah. And that course. was a lesson for me because, you know, we can't help but compare ourselves sometimes. I'm like, oh my gosh, they've been doing hair so much shorter time than me. And they have this big following and they're so famous and all the companies want them to teach for them and they love them. And then I go and get a haircut and I'm like, that was an epic fail. That was like the worst thing that I ever could have done. Of course, my husband still got the credit card. Don't you own a salon? Why did you get these two? Because you want to see, right? Like what yeah. is so special? And to your point, I could not have been treated worse than I did in yeah. those two instances. It was like, yeah. I was complete. I said, do I have my invisible cream on? My daughter was with me. I'm like, am yeah. I invisible today? Like not, can I get you a beverage? Can I help you with your yeah. robe? This is where to get, it was kind of like go on the elevator level two, whatever. And I was like, wow, that yeah. is like a true example of smoke and mirrors that I did not, I, I don't want that to be my legacy for sure. And I know yeah. you don't either. I mean, I've taken, I've been to celebrity, you know, colorist myself, especially early on in my career. I took my mom to some of them. I mean, you know, very, some very, very famous, you know, very famous colorists. And it was shocking, the experience, and sometimes to the end result, you know, and, and that is where, you know, like I said earlier, like some people stop start thinking like, oh, I'm the best. I don't need to try as hard because I'm clearly that good. And that's where like, you always need to fight to be the best, you know, the best version of yourself, you know? And and where people stop mattering, it's just like they're a number in, in the day. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I've definitely seen that. And, and then there's just some people, frankly, who I think are just smoke and mirrors across the board, you know, that they kind of always have been and that's been their thing. And they can get a really good picture, but you know, maybe when you dig through, it's not as uh, thoughtful as maybe you thought it was. Um, you know, I think different strokes, different folks, I guess. But for me, I definitely want to be able to, in real life, have the work look and and feel and you know, and all the things that I'd I'd want it to be, and not just because I filtered it to death or because I know some good hashtags. I do think Instagram is amazing and I do think there's a lot of good that can come from it and it's connected hairdressers. And, you know, I think people share their formulas now, you know, which I always have, but there's always been a lot of people that have kept them so, you know, tightly locked up and stuff, which I never understood. I'm like, okay, you're not Claire all you didn't, inv you didn't invent this. Like, what is the secret here? Like six right. NN and six A, six A. Oh, wow. Mystery. <laughs> um, but, you know, outside of that, it's like, I really, I do think it's like, we have to remember that like the reality of like what we do and how we make people feel and and the, the chance we have every day behind the chair to get more clients from just those few people that we already, that already trust us, hopefully, you know, and, um, and just make them feel really special and love their hair, you know? I love that. And I love that you mentioned Miss Clara because to your point about us being, um, forever students and always looking for the next big thing. I know that one of your favorites is good old liquid Miss Clara. And that is a testament to your foundational 
understanding of formulation that you can rock a Miss Clairol. I've seen your clients that you've used Miss Clairol on, and there's mm -hmm. there's a reason Miss Clairol is still around after a bajillion yeah. years, and yep. all these other companies are folding up and getting bought up by other companies, um, and it still exists. So I think sometimes people blame, I see a, a trend of that where everyone's blaming the product. 99.9% .9 of the time it's user error. It has nothing yep. to do with the product um, for sure. And I think you're so humble and you're so so full of knowledge, but you're always the, the student. You're always a sponge. You always take little pieces of what everybody teaches you and create something um, even better with your creativity. And I love that about you. And I know you're, you're just heating up now. You're still a young bull. You have a lot more years in the industry. So I, I am blessed to call you my friend. I'm blessed to have learned so much from you, um, from just our fun conversations alone, let alone shadowing you in your salon and, and your generosity. Like I'm like, dude, I, I want to see your salon. I want to visit. You're like, come, come spend the day. And like you said, most salon owners, oh, I don't want anybody knowing my secrets. Yeah. You're an open book because you know yeah. that it's not a recipe. It's not just mix this and this and put it on everybody's hair, that it's going to be a different result. There's porosity, there's density, there's so many other factors that come into play. Um, but I, I want to see more of you. I want you to do more. Other than my retreat, I think we really need to get that Sunny and Share Act going on the, on the road. I'm I think down. people miss in-person education oh, yeah. and I think for sure. For sure. a more intimate version like I can see us doing something with like 25 people where they really get our attention and not yeah. 300 people on a big drop down screen and a powerpoint like really get our hands in there and do like fundamental everyday color that's missing in all the fluff you know I mean even just I mean, I always say this, but I, I feel like I'm a broken record with this, but it's like, I mean, even things as simple as like a base shift or a base adjust or things like gray coverage. I mean, you know, how to make someone a redhead, you know, I mean, even just, you know, you know, getting a, a, a you know, great coverage, getting an even result. I mean, all these things, it's like, I see so many people slapping base colors on. I see so many dark hairlines. I see so many things that I just feel like fundamentally is lacking in the industry, you know, 100%. like redheads blow people's minds and like, and, you know, glazing or shifting the base some and all of these things. It's like, I just still see people struggle so much. And that for me is such an easy, like, you know, bread and butter client. And it, I don't mean it's, I should say it's simple. It's not easy, right? It's it's like that saying, like, right. it is simple, but it is not easy. And I do think there is such a need for, for people understanding how to get an even canvas, you know? Because I just see so many people just going in and highlighting. And I'm like, okay, that's great and all. But, like, now it's like a tic-tac-toe board. You have these, like, highlights going this way and these bands going all the way down. And it's like, maybe we should try to even that out a little bit before we go and add a ton of dimension to it. Um, so I don't know, I, I do really, I just feel so strongly about that. Of course, the painting and the highlighting and all that is stuff I love too. But I think the foundation for so many people is scares them, intimidates them. They think it's not important, whatever the case may be. I think it's the thinks it's not important thing I, because I think people have gotten so used to under lifting and over correcting that they're not ever really correcting the overall um, hair. And that's what um, I started when we started chatting. I said, my colors that I finally found who knows what they're doing is leaving Florida. I, I was trying to do it myself because I couldn't find mm -hmm. anybody. So you can imagine the banding in my hair. And the first visit with her, she had me blocked off for an entire four hours. And I was mm -hmm. like, hella freaking Lily, Louie, finally yeah. somebody who gets that I'm a brand new client. And even yeah. though I'm a colorist, I've been to a lot of different colors because I've moved here almost three years ago and nobody quite got it right, but nobody took the time. She yep. went through and literally colored every piece of my hair. Like there was yep. not a piece of hair that was not addressed. And I was like, oh, thank you, Lord. And now she's moving. <laughs> I'm like, where are you moving? I'm coming. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm holding you to that. We need to do, I have access to a beautiful, big beauty school in Sarasota. 
you oh, and I, I mean, need I to get Florida, that so on the bus. I'll be there anytime. All right, you heard it, folks. You heard it. When he blows me off, a, when I when I follow up with him, when he blows me off, you can call him out. But I think I that needs to happen because I think it's to your point, foundations, foundation, foundation, foundation. And we're not talking. I mean, you can hear from us chatting right now. It's not going to be a boring, you know. Here is the color wheel, and this cancels mm -hmm. this. Actually showing, you know, what do you do when a client has banding? What do you do when a client has hot? What do you do when a client's browned out? You know, all those everyday fixes from a, a fundamental and, and I've never seen you over abuse hair to get there. It's always in the gentlest, best way possible. So I think that yeah. is the perfect, the perfect class. So let's do and it. And I think too, it's like, it doesn't, for me, I mean, you know, you and I both, I would say, um, we... I don't use just one line, you know what I mean? It's like, I don't think this is only achieved, you know, using X or only achieved using Y, you know, I think that's the the nice thing too, is that you and I both have, are very open-minded and, and that a lot of products can be great. I mean, I use everything from, you know, my, I mean, I use Clairol, I use Redken, I use, I mean, I use a ton of Fermisi. I mean, that's probably a line I use a ton of. And, you know, I use L'Oreal, well, like Goldwell, all these things, you know, you, you know, the same thing, Alpha Parf, like everything. And so, I think too, like having the experience of all those different lines and sure we can have our favorites and those things, but the fundamentals of understanding the finish. And like I said earlier, the finish and, you know, the alkalinity and, you know, the lift and all those things that these different lines are giving us allows us to help a lot of people because it's not just a one size fits all. And it's not only achieved by using this line. Right. So the knowledge is really just, it's just that it's uh, it's applying it to many different lines and yeah sure it's strand testing and you know things are swatching out to understand your line better but it really is an across the board kind of kind of um approach you know you and i both share that which i 100%, love 100 100 and that's what it's all about so tell people how they can find more of you. I know you're not big on Instagram, but is there a way that they can find you and learn more about future education and things like that? Yes. Yeah, so I'm on Instagram. Um, we'll as answer you if you reach out. <laughs> <laughs> I have gotten a little better. I'm on as Ian Matthew Color. So that is, um, you know, that is my um, personal um, handle for color. And then, you know, I work at 180 Salon in Washington, D.C. Um, so those are the two places you'll see me. You'll find me. Awesome. So if your color's jacked, especially if you're a colorist and you want to get your color done and treat yourself, go see Ian and have him correct your mess and, and stop, you know, us hairdressers have it slapped on and drive home with it on our roots and wash it ourselves and do all those things. So it's nice to be, to get a treat. And DC is a fun city to visit too. So it's a nice, yeah, little, nice little road DC trip. Is, yeah, it's a fun, it's a fun, fun little city. Well, I'm happy I finally nailed you down and got you on the podcast. And I look forward to seeing you at the retreat. I'm so, so excited. I'm like oh wishing gosh, away I the cannot, rest of the year because wait. I wanted to be here sooner. <laughs> I know I cannot wait. I'm like, I, I just, I love the beach and I love warm weather. And so anytime I can do that, mix hair and warm weather, sign me up. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you again, my friend. And thank you all for listening. And we'll see you on the next one. Thank you.